This is going to be an overview on the book of Ecclesiastes. And this was always one of my favorite books in the Bible when I first became a Bible-believing Christian. It's a really short book. It has 12 chapters, 222 verses, and 5,584 words. Ecclesiastes is a sermon preached by Solomon, the preacher. Solomon would not be allowed to preach in most churches today because many men are too self-righteous for their own good. They wouldn't allow someone like Solomon to preach, even though the Bible calls him the preacher, and he wrote the wisdom books, and he's called the wisest man. Vanity is a key word in the book. It implies something is useless and without profit when it's not connected with God. The theme of this book is life under the sun. And that will explain a lot for you when you're reading this book. Because that's how he's looking at things is from the perspective of life under the sun. And most times Solomon is looking at things from just looking at things from the world. As if all that there was is what you see under the sun. What people see on TV is a bunch of filthy rich trash trying to live life to the fullest while living like the devil. And the devil is giving men fame and fortune and temporary pleasure and happiness in exchange for them brainwashing the masses to be stupid idiots with no morals. But Solomon had all that these rich famous people had and much more. And yet he says it's all vanity. The book of Ecclesiastes pictures the worldly man. He may have pleasure for a while, but he'll soon find out everything is vanity. This book shows us that life is pointless outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ. This book shows you that you will not be satisfied with the tem temporal things, no matter how much of it that you have. If you had everything that you wanted, and I mean everything, at the snap of your fingers, just like Solomon had, you'll come out saying, it's all pointless. And you just look up the testimonies of celebrities, they say that they're not happy. There are at least ten vanities in the book. One of the vanities is wisdom itself. Ecclesiastes 2.13 says, Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly, as far as light excelleth darkness. Another one is labor. That's another thing that he calls vanity. Ecclesiastes 2, 18 and 19. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yet shall he have rule over all my labor, wherein I have labored, and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. So all the work you're doing to compile these temporary things, all that stuff is just going to be left to someone else, and who knows if they're going to use it as a door stopper or just throw it in the trash. Another thing that's vanity is purpose. Ecclesiastes 2.26, For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner he giveth travail, to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Another thing is ambition. Ecclesiastes 4.4, 4, Again, I considered all travail and every right work, that for this a man is envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. Another thing is the fun things in life. For as the crackling, in Ecclesiastes 7, 6, For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. That also is vanity. Just going to do things that are fun, like going to an amusement park, things like that, it's just all vanity. It's temporary. I mean, you've been to places where you just go for the sake of having fun. You may have a little memory of it but it's all vanity you can't get it back it's gone that laughter's gone the next one is fame ecclesiastes 4 16 there is no end of all the people even of all that have been before them they also that come after shall not rejoice in him 
Surely this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. You see, there is no end of all the people, even of all the ones that have been before you. Yet nobody remembers them. There's so many people that not everybody's going to be remembered fame. If someone was famous in the past, they're not hardly remembered anymore. It was all vanity. Another one is money. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. So money itself is pointless and vanity. Number eight, selfishness. Ecclesiastes 4, 6, and 7. Better is an handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. Then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. Another one is covetousness. Ecclesiastes 6, 9. Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. Another one is reward, Ecclesiastes 8, 10. And, I, and so I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of the holy, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This is also vanity. All the things that you do in this life that have nothing to do with God, it's all going to be forgotten. All the things you've accomplished. But in chapters 1 through 4, you really see that all is vanity. In chapters 5 through 10, you see all devices man brings up to try and get around God. In chapters 11 through 12, you have Solomon's con conclusion of the whole thing. Ecclesiastes 12.1, it says, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Let us... In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So God is all that matters. Remember him, keep his commandments. This is from a man, Solomon, who seen it all and he did it all. He had everything. He was the wisest man that ever lived. He lived for God. And there were times he lived for the world. And his conclusion was to fear God and keep his commandments. That was the best thing that he found in his life. That was his conclusion that he came up with. But let's look at chapter 1. In chapter 1 you see the great question. Ecclesiastes 1.3 What profit hath a man of all his labor which he hath taken under the sun? When it comes to that 40-hour week you're doing on this earth, it is under the sun. It's vain. Anything that can get you under the sun is vain. It's meaningless. You may work 40 hours and retire, and then how many years do you have left to enjoy the money that you piled up in the bank account? Not many years. You may get a house, a boat, a couple cars, and a fancy wardrobe or something, however... When you're on your deathbed, is it really going to matter all that about all that stuff you have? It's just going to be left to somebody else. That foolish country song, and I wholeheartedly believe that country music is of the devil. It says money can't buy everything, but then he says it can buy me a boat, it can buy me a truck, and he just starts naming off all these worldly things that he can get with money, and he even uses a little bit of Bible in there. I see that as straight up mockery. But I tell you what, that money can buy, it can buy you a lot of things, but it can't get you out of hell. It can't get you happiness. It can't get you a ticket to heaven. And the only way your labor will profit you is if it was for the Lord. An honest 40 hour work week will profit in eternity if you do that to provide for your family and if you're living a good Christian life in front of the co-workers and your boss. As it says in 1 Timothy 5, 8, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. If your labor is to win souls, then that will profit in eternity. The labor that is for things under the sun is what is vain and worthless. 
There are many people who are evil workers, breaking their back every day, every week, just for the world and for the devil. And that is pointless and vain. Ecclesiastes 1.4 says, One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. Some men are so busy trying to make a name for themselves, and in their mind, they are all that matters in this world. They don't realize one generation passeth away, and another generation cometh. If the world keeps going for 100 years, then almost everything going on right now will be forgotten. The sports stars today will be unknown by the young generation in 100 years. Uh, they'll think about LeBron James as much as you think about Babe Ruth. Uh, the actors and actresses will be no names. Sure, you'll have some some people's names who, who beat Father Time, but as a general rule, everyone's name gets forgotten. Ecclesiastes 1.11 says, There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. They're not going to remember you. Verse 9 and 10 in Ecclesiastes 1 says, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and the thing which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new? It hath been already of old time, which was before us. People think that the things they have are new. However, there is no new thing under the sun. Even the movies are remakes, and they're copycats of other movies. The new iPhone is pretty much just like the last iPhone. Every country song talks about the same thing. All the rappers rap about the same stuff. Every plot from every book or movie can be found in the King James Bible. They just change the names of the characters and the location and little small details. But still, if you read the Bible, you're going to find that same plot somewhere in the pages. Ecclesiastes 1, 12 through 14 says, I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. This is Solomon. And I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. I have seen all the works that are alone, or that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, had all the money, all the girls, all the material possession, all the power. He had more women and money than Jay-Z and Drake and Kenneth Copeland and any other money-hungry person ever thought about having. He came away with the conclusion that it is all vain and pointless. He could go to bed with a different woman every night, yet he said it's all vain. He could go to the car dealership and buy every brand new model on the lot. He said it's all vain. In chapter 1, we see a great truth for all of man who is trying to live without God and gain happiness through science. There is a problem. Verse 9. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. There isn't anything you can make that is going to give you lasting happiness or eternal life outside of God. There is no new thing under the sun. They're always coming out with something supposedly new that is going to improve your life. They're trying to get eternal life through new scientific discoveries or technology, or something. But there's no new thing under the sun. Now chapter 2, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 4 through 6. Solomon said, I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards. And I planted trees. I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. Some people think they would be happy if they bought a brand new house or if they had a house like those people have on HGTV or even if they had one of these tiny houses. Solomon had all that and more. If Solomon was on that show MTV Cribs, it would take a whole season of that show just to show the downstairs area. A Hugh Hefner in the Playboy Mansion wouldn't have been able to keep up with Solomon. I mean, Solomon had a big mansion. He had all the girls. He had more little Playboy bunnies running around than Hugh Hefner ever thought about. 
Ecclesiastes 2.8 says, I gathered me also silver and gold, and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers, and the delights of the sons of men, as musical instruments, and that of all sorts. So Solomon could have had a live concert every night in his backyard with the top acts of his day that were on the billboards breaking the records. He, he may not have had YouTube or Pandora radio, but all that... But he, he had all the big-name guys just come to his house and sing. There is nothing new under the sun. He had everything that you have, but it was better. He had it better. Ecclesiastes 2.16, For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever. Seeing that which, is not, which now is, and the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man? As the fool. As a general rule, a wise man won't have any more remembrance in this world than a fool does. Sometimes, sometimes the wise man will have even less remembrance than a fool. Do you remember preachers like Harold Seitler, Lester Roloff, J. Harold Smith, Buster Seaton, Oliver B. Green, Percy Ray? Ask the average church member if they remember any men like this. They will have no idea who you're talking about. Ask them if they remember Elvis, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Tupac, Kurt Cobain. And their eyes will light up because that was their heroes. The fool in this world ends up a lot more famous than a wise man. This is because the world is foolish. But still, even these big names like Tupac and Kurt Cobain, their names... Are going to fade away if time goes on. Ecclesiastes 2.17 Therefore I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Solomon reminds me of a Christian who lives for the world. The Christian who lives for the world can't get satisfied with the things of this world. They are trying to get their appetite full with the pleasures of this life and it just does not work. They end up being miserable and hating their life. Just like Solomon says, I hated life. Ecclesiastes 2.18, I hated all my labor, which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. So everything that you have, if it lasts, will be passed on to somebody else. They may throw it in the trash. They may use it as a coaster. They may use your books to prop the door open. Man tries to gain a happiness through being wise. And this won't work either. Solomon said in chapter 2 and verse 15, Then said I in my heart, As it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart, That this also is vanity. Solomon died and went back to the dust just like the fool does. You may think, Well, I got this great trait. I got this great thing about me. That God's just going to let me live forever because I'm so great in this way. You're forgetting Solomon, the wisest man in the world. He died and went back to the dust. Just like a fool. Chapter 3. In verse 1. To everything there is a season. And a time to every purpose under the heaven. So there is a time for everything. Solomon gets into that in the beginning of, of this chapter. There is a time for everything. Make sure most of your time revolves around the Lord and His book. Ephesians five fifteen and 16 says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. There's a time for everything, but make sure most of your time revolves around the Lord. Ecclesiastes three nineteen through 21 for that which befalleth the sons of man, men befalleth beasts, even one thing befalleth them. As the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. All go into one place, all are of the dust, and all are turned to dust again. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? You're going to die just like that stray dog on the street. That thing which befalleth beasts will happen to you. 
Ecclesiastes 3.20, all go into one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. This doesn't mean that when you die, you cease to exist or anything at death. This isn't referring to the soul. Your body goes to the dust. Your soul goes to heaven or hell, and your spirit goes back to God. But under the sun, your body, if you're living life, and all you care about is things under the sun then the body is all you care about. And if that's all you have, all you have in your future is death. You have no hope because the things of this world may have may bring temporary pleasure, but it's, te but it's temporary, and then you die. Chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Wherefore I praise the dead which are already dead, more than the living which are yet alive. Yea, better is he than both they which hath not yet been, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. It would be better for a man to have never been born than for him to be born and go through this world and see its evil work and then die and go to hell. Jesus said in Mark 14, 21 that it would have been better for Judas to have never even been born. Ecclesiastes 4, 13, Better is a poor and wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. My four-year-old daughter has more sins than most of the wicked rulers in this world. You can ask her, what must I do to be saved? And she will say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Or you can ask her, why do you need to be saved? And she'll say, because I'm a sinner. She may not know what these things mean yet exactly, but she has more spiritual sense than Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders and Barack Obama and even President Trump. If you ask Trump what kind of Bible we should use, he wouldn't have the slightest idea. Ask my daughter and she will say the King James Bible. Better is a poor and wise child than an old, foolish king or billionaire. You should respect your elders, but many times they don't have any more sense than you have. A Trump's spiritual advisor is a 40-year-old woman or a 40, 50-year-old woman, however old she is. But that's uh, that's very sad. If you are a 70-year-old man and you're having to get spiritual advice from a younger woman, that's very sick. And I'm not saying anything against Trump. I like him and all that. But you have to admit, these people who seem to be big shot wise people, when it comes right down to it, when it comes to the things of God, they are fools. I've been in the I've been the youngest person in a room by about 20 years and the only one who wasn't cussing God. Age does not always mean that you're wiser. It goes both ways. There's pride in the young men, there's pride in the in the older men. And what it comes down to is whoever is viewing things from the the Bible and God's perspective is right and whoever's looking at it with a worldly perspective is wrong, even if it sounds like it's right. God is always right, and we may not be always right. We're only right when we do what God says. Chapter 5, verse 2. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. People ask me many times, why are you so quiet? It's because of verses like this. I've experienced that the more I talk, the more trouble I can get in. The more I talk, the less I learn. The more I talk, the more likely I am to say something that I'm going to regret. And the more I talk, the more someone will know how stupid I am. I mean, really, I don't know very much at all about anything. The more I talk, the more stupid looking I become. Peter says in 1 Peter 4.11, If any man speak... Let him speak as the oracles of God. The oracles of God, that's what God said. That's your Bible. If you're going to speak, then say what God says and talk about this book, what the book says. You read through the Gospels and you see Jesus casting out devils. You, you want to get the devils out of you? Read the Bible. And when you get to those verses and you see Jesus using the word to cast out devils, Maybe while you're reading it, it'll cast the devils out of you. Just soak yourself in the book. 
Ecclesiastes 5.3, For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. The more you talk, the more your idiocy will be exposed. Ecclesiastes 5.11, When goods increase, there increase that eat them, and what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? What good is it, all the stuff you have, other than just to look at it? The beholding of the things with your eyes. I've always thought it was pointless to have a whole bunch of things that you just set up on a shelf. I mean, especially when I was young, because, I mean, you can't play with it. You really can't touch it because you might break it. It's just you set it there and look at it. Just even before I was saved as, as a young kid, I always thought it was pointless to just collect things that you just set on a shelf. And it is all vain. You know, what good is there of these things to the owners, saving the beholding of them with your eyes. Ecclesiastes 5.12 says, The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. Do you know why you can't sleep at night? Because you're not working enough. For most people. Get up every day at about 4.30, Study and read the Bible for about one or two hours. Go to work for eight to ten hours. Then come home and play with your family. Eat with your family. Play with the kids. Then come home. Read and study some more. Go outside and play with the kids. Take them for a walk in the park. Then when you go to bed, your eyes will be closed in about five minutes. Wake up early. Get to work. And the more you labor, the sleepier you're going to become. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet. I can go to sleep anywhere, anytime. I just wait till nighttime. Because nothing good happens at night, so I like to go to bed right before it gets dark. The verse also said that the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. The rich man stays up all night because he's worried about someone taking his riches away. Or how to keep the money rolling in so that he doesn't become broke ecclesiastes 5 15 and as he came forth of his mother's womb naked shall he return to go as he came and shall take nothing of his labor which he may carry away in his hand all that material stuff you've gathered under the sun is something you can't take with you the greatest illustration i can think of for this is your dreams there has been times where i was dreaming and in the dream i had some type of material possession in the dream and i was loving it especially when i was a little kid i would dream i had a new basketball goal or something and towards the end of the dream i would realize i was dreaming and then i realized i wouldn't be able to take this toy or whatever it was that i had i couldn't take it with me out of the dream life is like that you can't take your car or your guns or your house with you when you die no matter how much you want to keep them forever that's the way it is with a dream. You have something in the dream you like. You realize when you wake up it's going to be gone. That's the way you should view life. It's just as, as small and as short as a dream. And these things that you have in this life, you can't grab a hold on to it and take it with you in the afterlife. Chapter 6, Ecclesiastes 6.6 6. Yea, though he live a thousand years twice told, yet hath he seen no good. Do not all go to one place. Even if you live 2,000 years, you're still going to die. Methuselah lived about 969 years, and he's dead. You have people today wanting to live forever in their fallen, sinful state. But that's why God put a cherubim to guard the tree of life so that Adam couldn't eat off of it and live forever. It wouldn't do you any good to live in this fallen state. Ecclesiastes 6, 7, All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. You have to keep eating every day. You'll never get to a point where you won't need to eat again. There'll never be a time where you just eat a big bowl of spaghetti or an entire pizza and say, I'm full, I'm never going to have to eat again. That will never happen. Sometimes I'll have a delicious meal right in front of me, and I can't wait to eat it because it looks so good. Then when I get done... I'm so full, I think to myself, how did I even eat all that? But then, like, a couple, a couple hours later or the next day, I'm hungry again. 
you just can't get full. Your belly's never satisfied. The eyes of man are never satisfied. Then the next day, you're just starving again. And you can't get full one last time. It'll never happen. You'll always get hungry again. You can't be satisfied in this life, no matter how good the food is. Ecclesiastes 6.12 For who knoweth what is good for man in this life? All the days of his vain life, which he spendeth as a shadow. For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? That sums up your life. It is vain and it is a shadow. Stop and think about how much you do a day that is so ridiculously pointless. Everything outside of the God of this world and the word of God and the soul of men, everything you do that doesn't involve those things is completely pointless. Chapter 7, verse 1. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. If you have a good name, then you have a great thing. If you're a Christian and you bring your Bible to work every day, you are making a good name. But you are also making yourself have a huge responsibility. If you're a preacher or a deacon or a Sunday school teacher, just a zealous Christian, and everyone knows about it, then you have a huge responsibility. You aren't only protecting a good name. You will have a huge influence on people's impression of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are an ambassador. You need to act right. You need to quit cussing and telling these dirty jokes and fornicating and lying and doing all these horrible things that you're letting the lost world see while at the same time you're supposedly a Bible-believing Christian that ruins your testimony and you're bringing shame to the name of God. You need to protect your name. A good name is better than precious ointment. Ecclesiastes 7, 5. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. It's better for you to get a strong rebuke from a wise man that will sting than for you to hear a song by the 6-9 rapper or young boy never broke again or juice world or nba young boy or whoever are these these rappers are now that are making people a bunch of idiots it's better for you to hear the rebuke of the wise than for you to hear six nine and Nicki minaj all these very wicked people ecclesiastes seven seventeen says be not over much wicked that's what these people are that I just mentioned, over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? The wickeder you are, the shorter your life will be as a general rule. They say the average age of a rock star is 36 years old. You can die before your time. You can keep on sinning and living wicked and God will just let you die and go to hell early if you are not saved. Ecclesiastes 7.20 For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. I don't care what your holiness preacher says. He is a liar if he says he doesn't sin. He is telling you a bold-faced lie. There ain't a just man on earth who does good and sins not. And if he says he has no sin, he deceives himself, as it says in Galatians 6.3. It says, For if a man think himself to be something, when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. If your preacher is getting up saying, I don't sin, he thinks he's really something, but he's actually nothing. 1 John 1, 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 10, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So you're going to be such a bold-faced liar to get up and tell me that you ain't never sinned, or, I mean, to tell me that you're not presently sinning and needing to get uh, confess and forsake it every day. All you're saying to me is you are a big fat liar. Ecclesiastes 7, 21 and 22. Also take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. For oft times also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise hast cursed others. When someone says something negative about you, just don't take it to heart. When you hear that someone has said something behind your back, just look over it. Because you know there were times when you criticized that same person behind their back. And if you work on the job, then you probably know that everybody talks about everybody. Just don't look much into it. Because for oftentimes also thine own heart knowest 
that thou thyself likewise hast cursed others. So take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. If you hear your, your friend or somebody say something bad about you, just overlook it because everybody's talking bad about everybody every day. Chapter 8, Ecclesiastes 8.11 Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Men think that since nothing bad is happening to them, that they're getting away with sin. But God is just patient and long-suffering. He will wait a while before he knocks you upside the head many times. Chapter 9, 9.12 For a man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. You don't know the day of your death. And I asked a guy the other day, what's keeping him from getting saved? And he said, time. And I just thought that was odd. I'm like, understanding time should make you realize that you need to get saved. Chapter 10, 10 and verse 8, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. If you break the hedge around you that God's put around you, the serpent's going to bite you. Ecclesiastes 10, 20, Curse not the king, no, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. So watch what you say, even when you think that nobody important is around or hears you. A bird of the air will carry the voice. That person is going to find out what you said about them, probably one way or another. It's going to get sent to them in, in Messenger or on an email, or it may have been recorded. You never know. And notice that the bird shall carry the voice. The bird of the air. The devil's called the prince of the power of the air. Devils are likened to unclean birds in the Bible. There's, there, You're never alone. There's always spirits around. Chapter 11. Ecclesiastes 11, 5. As thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb, of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. Just like you don't know how you can't understand how that those bones of that child grow in the womb. You don't know the works of God. His ways are past finding out. He's unsearchable. You couldn't get the greatest search engine and search the things that God knows. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. You're going back to the dust. Your soul is either going to heaven or hell, and your spirit's going back to God. You need to get saved. That way your soul will go to be with God at death. And at the rapture, your body will come up out of the grave, meet your soul, and you'll get a glorified body. And then in Ecclesiastes 12, 11 through 14, Solomon gives you some preaching instructions. It says, the words of the wise are as goads. That means they ought to be sharp and be able to uh, poke the listener to get them right with God. And as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, you have to nail stuff down. You really get it in people's mind, which are given from one shepherd. And further by these, my son, be admonished. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study is a weariness to the flesh. If you're in the book a lot and you're studying all the time, it can be a weariness to the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's what you need to do in this life. Every time you wake up, every time you make a decision, fear God and keep His commandments. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. God sees everything. God's keeping record of everything. Just remember that when you're making decisions, when you're deciding what to do throughout the day. And just remember that all things outside of the Jesus Christ, if you don't have Jesus Christ in this life, all things are pointless.